Then we'll might as well get started. Um, so this is the third lecture in my series. Um, and this one I've given the fanciful title of Waking the Dead. I've stolen that from a TV series, but it's about how we're going to use genomes uh, from uh, archaic humans to inform our understanding of human evolution. So I must have feel, been feel, when I prepared this lecture, I must have been feeling very virtuous because I've actually written some learning outcomes here which is what you're supposed to do, I suppose. Um, I've put the further reading here, uh, so you can pick that up um, if you want to, some of the papers that I'll be mentioning. Um, and these are the issues I'm going to talk about as we go through the talk. This time, there's no videos. I used to have Eddie Izzard talking about Neanderthals, but I decided in the end it was a bit naff, so I left that bit out. Um, so... What, is, what does Neanderthal mean? Well, Neanderthal is the name of a valley near Düsseldorf in, in Germany. Um, and it was named after a, a 17th century pastor whose name was Joachim um, Neumann. And for some reason, they decided to turn it into Greek and call it Neander, which is Neumann, Neumann in, in Greek, and, and named that bit of the valley. After. It's part of the Dussel, actually, the river, but it's that, that bit called, got called Neander Valley. Um, and Tal means valley in German, and it used to be spelt with an H, and then in spelling reforms in the early 20th century, they took out the H's. But because the Neanderthal started being used to talk about human evolution before then, the H stayed in um, for um, the taxonomy, in terms of the naming of the species and so forth. And we're now in a situation where both forms are used. And so if you go to do a PubMed search, you have to type in Neanderthal with the H or Neanderthal without the H to get all the papers. And it seems to have fallen into a situation where on this side of the Atlantic we put the H in. So nature puts the H in Neanderthal. On the other side of the Atlantic, science doesn't put in the H. So it's a bit of a weird situation. <coughs> now, what actually happened here was there were um, numerous caves and rock shelters along the valley. It kind of looked a bit like uh, Cheddar Gorge. I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. Um, and there was one that was called the Kleiner Feldhof Quarter. In the 1850s, they started, as part of the industrialization of that part of Germany, they started with being a demand for limestone, for lime, and they quarried away and started to remove the caves and the valley walls. And uh, as, the, as part of that process, in August 1856, a skull cap and 15 postcranial bones were recovered from this cave, this kind of Feldhof quarter. Now, it was first of all thought that this was a cave bear, but it was then shown to a local teacher, a natural historian, Fulrot, who said, no, these look human, but not any kind of human that we've seen before, a kind of strange fossil human. And so they were first reported scientifically by Fulrot and Schaffhausen in 1857. Now, as often the case in science, the discovery of a thing, uh, in fact, is just the first time it comes to widespread um, acknowledgement. And in fact, it turned out that people had discovered Neanderthals before those discoveries in the Neander Valley. Um, there was a skull discovered in Gibraltar in 1848 um, and other, other human remains found in Belgium in 1829 which also are now recognised as being part of the Neander, Neanderthal um, lineage and um, the discovery of this Gibraltar skull, this is a, co a pound coin um, celebrating that discovery that, that skull was actually shown to Darwin so Darwin actually came face to face in his lifetime with a, a Neanderthal. And it was very interesting and poignant for him because he had not said much about human evolution in, in the origin of species. You remember, he just said, light will be thrown on the origin of man. Um, uh, and that um, the fact that they then discovered these archaic human forms uh, actually gave considerable impetus to the idea of e evolution and its application to humans. Now, one of the most interesting stories, I think, in paleoanthropology comes from a paper that was published around the turn of the millennium, just after the turn of the millennium, where they went back 
to the original Neanderthal site. Um, and by then, all the um, landmarks have been obliterated. They, quarrying had removed the sides of the valley. So there was long, flat areas all around the valley. So they had great difficulty finding out where was the original Neanderthal type site. But they used some ancient, uh, well, some um, old uh, etchings, uh, lithographs, and they were able to line up some of the landmarks they could see in these old etchings with what they saw then and worked out where it was. They started digging and they found more Neanderthal samples. And interestingly, this is a really amazing thing, is that some of the Neanderthal bones they found uh, nearly 150 years later actually fitted like pieces of a jigsaw into the specimens that have been discovered in the 19th century. So a, a remarkable piece of detective work there to find the original site. So this is the, the way the valley used to look, like I say, a bit like Cheddar Gorge, um, uh, in, in, in the 17th and, and 18th century. Um, this is how it looks today. And I was very fortunate that I was able to go there in November of last year. These are my photographs. So these holes here mark the site where they found the most recent set of bones. But what they think is that actually probably that Kleiner Feldhoff grotto was over here. There's a kind of bit of an escarpment there. And that's probably where they were originally found. But all the debris and everything would have been during the mining, it had all just fallen down into this area here. And the, the valley itself is running along. The river's just running along there. Now, since the discovery of, of, Neanderthal in, uh, of Neanderthals in Neanderthal, there are now over 400 specimens. So this is the, the most well-documented archaic form of human that we have. Um, and these sites, uh, the, the, these remains are being found at sites all over Europe, well, all over the parts of Europe that were not covered by uh, ice sheets, um, including parts of the British Isles, uh, parts of Spain, all the way over to, to the Levant, to uh, Palestine, up into uh, Anatolia. And uh, about 10 years ago, it was clear that they also occur even as far away as Siberia. So Neanderthals had a very large range here in Europe and Western Asia. Never been found in Africa and, or, or further um, east in Asia. Now the original reconstructions, this is actually uh, a statue at the Neander Valley site that was done a hundred odd years ago. Initially, it was the idea of Neanderthals with this brutish caveman form. But more recent reconstructions are much more sympathetic. And here are two from the Neanderthal Museum, which is adjacent to the uh, discovery site. And you can see this rather sympathetic reconstruction here of a, of a, of a Neanderthal, and here was a, a modern human. And here's a, a rather charming Neanderthal girl. Uh, looking a bit like a, perhaps like a Native American in a in, in a garb, um, but actually making this uh, uh, it, it clear that this is um, not a primitive human uh, in 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 the sense. And one of the most uh, interesting things they've done in the museum is that they've actually recreated a, a Neanderthal here and put him in a suit. Uh, so you know he could pass for a city trader just about. And here is a an age-matched, anatomically modern human next to the Neanderthal. You can see there's not much difference between them. Um, so these um, Neanderthals have kind of been rehabilitated in popular culture in recent years. Now when you look at um, the fossil record, you can see the first proto-Neanderthal features about 350,000 years ago. And full-blown Neanderthals uh, date from around 130,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. It was thought that they perhaps survived a bit longer than that. Um, and there were these ideas they might have survived 26,000 years ago in, in Spain. But that's now, um, that idea has been abandoned. And we're now saying that it's about 40,000 years ago they died out in Europe. Uh, but they did overlap with anatomically modern humans in Europe um, in time and in the range. 
uh, for probably about 5,000 years. My understanding is that there's no site that's been discovered where you can find anatomically modern human remains and, and, and Neanderthal remains right next to each other. Um, but in terms of the general geography of being in similar parts of Europe, it's clear that they did overlap. And they also appear to have their own uh, kind of culture, which archaeologists call the Mousterian culture, uh, with evidence of tool use, of fire, burials, of skinning. They appear to, to care for their injured. So I think there's one Neanderthal skeleton where the person clearly had a broken bone, and, and, uh, but it, at the, the, the fracture had healed, suggesting that they'd been looked after um, by, by other uh, Neanderthals. There's this interesting question about, did they share language with us? And one of the features in uh, anatomically modern humans that we um, place a great deal of credence on in terms of development of language and the uh, a way in which we can control our tongue and articulate is this thing called the hyoid bone um, in, the th in, in the throat here. And one of these was found in Israel um, and it, um, it's a called tongue bone or hyoid bone and it appears to be identical to anatomically modern humans. So Neanderthals, maybe they could speak. Uh, they, they were carnivores. And there is some evidence to suggest that they might have been cannibals. But it's unclear when you see scrapings on bones whether that meant that they were being prepared to be eaten or for some other reason. It's clear um, um, in, in kind of modern anthropology that in some cultures there is ritual defleshing of bodies so that you remove the flesh as a way of turning into skeletons more quickly and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're preparing them to be eaten. Now Neanderthals were anatomically distinct from um, anatomically modern humans um, in various ways. They, they um, have this so-called occipital bun at the back of the skull here. They have this uh, brow ridge and the receding forehead. Um, in terms of the uh, postcranial skeleton, they have uh, this barrel-shaped chest, um, and they are generally much more robust uh, than anatomically modern humans. Um, and it's said that the difference between uh, us and Neanderthals is, is, is anatomically is greater than the difference, say, between the two species of chimps that we recognise between the bonobo and the common chimp. Um, so we are quite distinct from them, and they're quite distinct from us, anatomically. Well, that's a simple answer anyway. It's a bit more complicated than that, as I'll say in a moment. So there's this coexistence for around 5,000 years. But then what happened to the Neanderthals? And this is one of those intriguing questions. Now, one idea is that maybe there was a genocide, that anatomically modern humans came out of Africa swept through Europe and just killed all the Neanderthals and uh, wiped them out. That, there isn't much evidence for that. There's no evidence of any, as I say, there's no evidence of them being on the same site at the same time or anything like that. But obviously what we know about the way in which humans have behaved when they've moved to other parts of the world in the past is that, uh, you know, in more recent times is that, that that kind of thing does happen. Question of whether there was a more gradual extinction. It does appear that they... Uh, their range slowly but surely um, got narrower and narrower over time. Um, and w you know, was it just ecological and climatological that they couldn't adapt to the end of glaciation? Maybe they were, they, it wasn't a genocide, but there was competition between anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals in certain traits. Maybe we were better at hunting or running than they were. Another option is, of course, that they didn't become extinct at all, but they were just assimilated into the anatomically modern human populations. Um, and that was interbreeding and, um, and, and uh, they, they're not extinct at all. Now the key question raised by that prospect is, was there actually any genetic exchange between, between anatomically modern humans and the Neanderthals? So the scenario that uh, we currently accept is that Neanderthals evolved from a common ancestor with humans. That common ancestor probably was in Africa. Certainly the ancestor of all anatomically modern humans, as we pointed out before, was in Africa. 
the Neanderthals or their ancestors of the Neanderthals moved into Europe um, and then maybe they just became extinct or maybe they interbred with the anatomically modern humans as they moved into Europe. Um, and this is an interesting question and there are various ways we can address this question uh, using sequences. Um, looking at bones, people have said in the past, there's a guy called Eric Trinkhaus who said for a long time that actually it's not that simple that there's Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. There are some skeletal remains that look intermediate or have features of one, uh, mainly one, but some of the other. But in terms of looking at sequences, how could we address this question? Well, one question is to go and look at Europeans and say, are there uh, sequences in Europeans that are not found anywhere else in the world and look as if they might be old enough to be Neanderthal in origin. And the studies that were done in the 1990s said, no, we can't really find any evidence of that. So the other way of looking at it was to look at ancient DNA and say, well, see if, if we can get any DNA sequences out of Neanderthal samples and see what they look like. And that relies on the amplification or retrieval of sequences from fossils. Now, one of the big problems with doing those kind of ancient DNA studies is that there's going to be very, very little of that DNA left in those samples. And there's going to be lots of human DNA in the handlers who've handled those samples. And, and so there is this tr tremendous problem with contamination with modern human DNA. Um, and so you have to be very careful when looking at these samples to see if it's true what you're seeing and not just take it at face value. Now mitochondrial DNA was the initial place where people started looking, favoured uh, because this is um, the present in a higher abundance than the nuclear genome in terms of kind of molar uh, copy, you know, copies per cell. Um, there's a region called the D loop in the mitochondrial genome which is, doesn't code for proteins and therefore is less constrained by evolution and evolves more quickly. So that provides quite a nice kind of barcoding uh, region for working out what lineage uh, 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 a mitochondrion belongs to. And we mentioned this before, that mitochondria are passed on in the, uh, through maternal transmission. So they can kind of give a, a nice clean result about what's happening on the maternal line uh, in a population. And so in 1997, we saw the first Neanderthal sequences. Um, and these were fragments of Neanderthal uh, DNA that were amplified using the polymerase chain reaction uh, from um, Neanderthal, a Neanderthal sample here. So they took this sample from the right humerus of a Neanderthal specimen and extracted DNA. And in fact, they've got in the museum, in the Neanderthal museum, they They've got these uh, tubes showing that this is the Neanderthal DNA. Whether that's a mock-up or whether that really is the DNA uh, preparation that they made back in 1997, I'm not, I'm not quite clear. But. So what did they find? Well, what they found when they drew a phylogenetic tree based on the sequence they retrieved was that Neanderthals sat outside of all anatomically modern human uh, sequence variation. So if you remember when I spoke before, I said... We're all African, you know, these long branches in Africa here, and all the non-Africans are really a very little subset. But all of that variation in Africans and non-Africans sits over here, and Neanderthals sit well outside it. So that suggests that the Neanderthal lineage branched away from anatomically modern humans a long time ago. It says here that the age of the common ancestor of Neanderthal and modern humans is about four times greater than the common ancestor of human mitochondrial DNAs. And this suggests, this is what they're saying, this suggests that Neanderthals went extinct without contributing mitochondrial DNA to modern humans. So that was the view there. And one of the points to note here is the last author, Svante Pabo. This is a name that you'll hear again and again over the next... Uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Um, he is the one individual that has transformed our view of human origins more than anyone else in modern times and uh, he's quite a remarkable individual and in he's been so persistent in following this particular line of research.
A few years later, in March 2004, another paper here saying no evidence of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA contribution to early modern humans. Um, and by this time, they said we address these issues by analysis of 24 Neanderthal and 40 early modern human remains. Um, and they, they got four Neanderthal and five early modern human remains that gave them enough DNA. And all of the four Neanderthals looked like each other um, and looked different from anatomically modern humans. Now, one of the questions that you have to say, well, if you're getting Neanderthal DNA that's tens of thousands of years old and it looks different from modern humans, maybe that's just because it's got degraded and there's characteristic patterns of degradation that make it look different. But by this time, they'd also retrieved anatomically modern human DNA sequences from tens of thousands of years ago and showed that they cluster quite clearly with the, within the distribution of mitochondrial DNA sequences uh, in modern day people. So again, by, by the time we get to 2004, we were looking at a situation. So by the time we got to 2007, uh, the assumption was, the conclusion was, that Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA is quite different from, from a, any uh, modern uh, human uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences, different from um, anatomically modern humans, different from modern day humans. And the common interpretation was that effectively we are two separate species, which is how it, how it was named. It was initially named Homo neanderthalensis to separate us from, homo, separate from Homo sapiens and little or no admixture. And this was consistent with the out of Africa hypothesis. But basically, there was a load of Neanderthals in Europe. But all the people that live in Europe now are the descendants of people who left Africa. Uh, 200,000 years, uh, 50,000 years ago, and modern humans evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago. And this um, little chart here, this, show, this alignment here, shows positions in the mitochondrial sequences where Neanderthals disagree with anatomically modern human sequences. So there's this so-called Cambridge reference sequence, which is used as the, com the common reference sequence for human mitochondrial DNA. And you can see that there are many sites here where the Neanderthals disagree with the modern DNA, but agree with each other. Um, and that uh, therefore shows that there really is something to this. And, and this is the list of um, sequences that were available at that time. I took on teaching this course in 2008. And that's when we start, that is where we started from. So this idea that Neanderthal DNA is quite different and that the mitochondrial evidence is, is quite uh, conclusive. There's a picture of Svante Pabo, and in 2006, late 2006, he started to get large amounts of nuclear DNA sequence from Neanderthals. Um, and it was put in, in nature as the dawn of Stone Age genomics. So the, for the first time, we're not getting just a few hundred base pairs, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of base pairs of mitochondrial, uh, of uh, Neanderthal uh, sequences. And again, this is from the museum. This is the original sample showing you a pipette, and it's a bit of a fanciful reconstruction of what actually happened. And uh, two papers appeared back to back in late 2006. Um, one of them uh, said that they're analysing a million base pairs of sequence. The other analysed about 65,000 base pairs of sequence. And the key question was, well, is there any evidence then of admixtures? Does this Neanderthal genome sequence look sufficiently different from modern Europeans, modern humans, to, to, to say that there was no admixture? Well, this paper, the one that had the same paper as the lead author, said that um, they, they did various, they fi fi fixed the split about 440,000 years ago, um, and then they did various studies, to, uh, various simulations to see if they could model any admixture of Neanderthal uh, DNA into modern humans, and they said that uh, there was a large confidence limit from 0 to 20% chance, 
but um, the maximum likelihood estimate for Neanderthal contribution to modern genetic diversity is zero. They did allow this little get out here. A definitive answer will require additional uh, Neanderthal sequence data. In the other paper, they were a bit more uh, equivocal about it. They found that, um, that there's high level of derived alleles in the Neanderthal is incompatible with a simple population split model uh, estimate. And, and so what they're saying is, well, maybe there was some gene flow between modern humans and Neanderthals. Um, and, and again, they say more extensive sequencing of the Neanderthal genome is necessary to address this possibility. Shortly after that, we then got the first complete mitochondrial genome sequence. So up until then, we've been getting a few hundred base pairs of, uh, of the mitochondrial genome sequence. Um, but um, we then got this uh, entire mitochondrial genome sequence of a, uh, of a Neanderthal reconstructed. And this taught us two things. Basically, there were a few some coding changes in amino acids um, between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans, and it's plausible that those may have biological consequences, perhaps in in respiration and um, survival in in certain environments or whatever. That's a little bit of a just so story, but the a, a more uh, poignant um, a pertinent uh, conclusion was that in the earlier reports of Neanderthal genome sequence data, it was clear that there was contamination with modern human uh, DNA. Um, and so that started to leave it, you know, can we trust anything that has been said in those previous couple of papers in terms of the, the admixture or not? Fast forward uh, another couple of years to 2010. And then we get a draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome. Um, and here they, they, they did this sequencing. Uh, they got 4 billion nucleotides from three individuals. So, you know, roughly one-fold coverage. Um, and they showed uh, something quite remarkable. So they, they took these various samples from Neanderthal Valley, India, in Croatia, over here in um, Caucasus and Spain. And... They did comparisons with chimp and anatomically modern human genomes, and they found that there were some changes in the anatomically modern human uh, lineage that, that were different from Neanderthals. Um, so that starts to allow us to dissect what made us different from Neanderthals. Um, it doesn't, nothing actually screams at you from that as to what the differences are. But um, it's, it was a starting point in actually trying to work out what makes us human in terms of anatomically modern human as opposed to Neanderthal. But of course the question that you really want to answer with this new genome sequence data is are Neanderthals more closely related to some anatomically modern humans than others? Which would answer the question, has there been any genetic exchange between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans? So they did this initial comparisons between the Neanderthal genomes we're getting and European Americans, East Asians, and West Africans. And what they found in that very first look was that Neanderthals looked more closely related to the non-Africans than they did to the Africans. But contrary to what they were expecting, it wasn't that the Neanderthals were closer to Europeans than to non-Europeans is that they were closer to all non-Africans. So East Asians, Chinese people also showed similarity to Neanderthals. And then they went on to confirm that comparison by looking at a set of uh, different ethnic groups. The San, mentioned the, the Bushmen from Southern Africa, the Yoruba from West Africa, the Han Chinese, French, and Papua New Guinean genomes. And what they showed there by doing that is that the flow, the direction of flow was from Neanderthals to non-African humans. And the irony was at that time that the, the best human genome sequence was that of Craig Venter, because uh, he was a vain man and he had his genome sequenced as part of the Solera genome sequencing project. 
And there were segments in which you could see that Craig Venter was more Neanderthal than he was African in his genome. And the conclusion of that paper was that between 1% and 4% of non-African genomes are Neanderthal. So that actually <laughs> upset the apple cart. That was completely contrary to expectations and a remarkable finding. So for one year I was saying Neanderthals are completely different and we didn't interbreed with them. And the next year I had to rewrite all the lecture to say, ah, uh, yep, there's been interbreeding. Um, and so what this tells us is that Neanderthal, we split sometime here, 400, 500,000 years ago. The branch of the Santon from modern humans then diversified to the Sun, West African. But here, in the out of Africa branch, Neanderthal DNA sequences then uh, introgressed, admixed into um, that population. Now, some of you may have heard of a genotyping service called 23andMe. Uh, a couple of years ago, I sent my saliva off to them and uh, they analyzed my DNA. And they can tell me now that I am 2.8% uh, Neanderthal. And my daughter is 2.7%. So I guess that means my wife must be a bit less Neanderthal than I am. Um, and I am on the 58th percentile for um, of all users. So I'm an average kind of European with an average amount of Neanderthal genome. And they point out here, if we took an average Japanese person, I'd be on the 53. Uh, 26 percentile among Chinese people, but if I was a Nigerian, uh, th th their average percentage of, of Neanderthal is only 0.3 percent. And so I would have, if I were a Nigerian, if I were Yoruba, then that would be a quite remarkable finding. But I'm just a boring European, and I am 2.8 percent Neanderthal. Okay, so. Let's uh, accept now then that uh, there is Neanderthal admixture into uh, modern populations and move away from that just for a while. We'll come back to that topic in a minute. But the other interesting question is, okay, once you start getting molecular data from Neanderthals, what can it tell you about their biology? Whether they, whether, in which ways were they the same as us? In which ways were they different? And actually, one of the first studies, well, the first study that I'm aware of in terms of using molecular data predates the genomic era. And this was looking at um, these particular sialic acid uh, residues that are found on the surface of cells. Um, and in humans, in the human lineage, there was an inactivation of a particular enzyme that put a particular uh, very common sialic acid uh, that's found in all other mammals on the surface of cells, we lost that. And that's why if you try and put a, an animal organ into a human, it's part of the reason why it gets a, rejected so quickly. Um, and so this loss here, if you look, if you do these uh, analyses, uh, chemical analyses, you can see a little blip here for the, this particular molecule in orangs, bonobos, chimps, but it's missing in humans. Um, and then they did the same analyses on Neanderthal samples and they found the same pattern. That basically there was a peak for this other related sialic acid, but this one was missing. Um, so that was an interesting insight that basically that um, loss of that particular enzyme must have predated the time which we diverged from the Neanderthals. There's a, another paper, that one of the f first papers that actually looked at gene sequences in Neanderthals. And they looked at uh, a gene that regulates pigmentation in humans. And they show, uh, and in humans, reg uh, variants of this gene, the MC1R gene, uh, that have reduced function are associated with uh, pale skin color and red hair. So you can, you know, it's kind of like the ginger mutant gene, if you like. Um, and what they, uh, they amplified and sequenced a fragment from this gene from Neanderthals. And both specimens showed a mutation in that gene that actually ablated function in that gene, but was different from anything seen in humans. So it's not that Neanderthals had the same pigmentation uh, as modern humans. But what they did in this study, which was particularly interesting, was that they amplified up that uh, variant that you see in Neanderthals, and they did some functional characterization of it. 
and showed that it actually was um, ablated. The function was actually uh, knocked down by this particular mutation, which led them to conclude that probably Neanderthals had pale skin uh, and probably fairish hair because of this mutation. Since then, there were a number of other isolated reports looking at individual genes. Uh, bitter taste perception is one of the things that geneticists love because you can, a single gene, you can tell whether someone can taste particular bitter substances. They showed that they could analyze that um, in, in Neanderthals um, and uh, that they could find that that gene, that bitter taste perception uh, variation, but they actually found there was variation between Neanderthals, so that variation in that gene seems to predate uh, the separation of our lineages. They could find the O antigen uh, group in, the, in blood groups um, in, um, in, in Neanderthals. And if you remember, we spoke about FOXP2 in an earlier lecture. It's just a, what the tabloids would call us the language gene. Um, this derived variant that we see in modern humans that has these additional amino acid changes that we don't see in other mammals Neanderthals had the same variant as us. So that twinned with the fact that they have a hyoid bone, you know, that makes it plausible that maybe they did have language. And every year as I look at this, things go on, um, you know, more and more studies have been done. So now what, what people have been doing is that they've been looking at the genomic landscape of Neanderthal ancestry in present day humans. And if you look um, and see where are the bits of the genome that are most Neanderthal. In Europeans and in East Asians, like these Chinese people, you see some differences uh, between the two. And then if you look at Sub-Saharan Africans, clearly very much, much less Neanderthal introgression. Uh, and it doesn't mean there's none at all, but, but uh, much less. Um, and... Um, the hunt is now on to try and understand what this means. Um, so as it says here, um, the genomic regions that derive from Neanderthals in any human today, typically less than 100 kilobases in, in size. Um, but there are uh, Neanderthal haplotypes are sufficiently distinctive um, that you can detect Neanderthal ancestry at specific loci. Um, and so they found that the Neanderthal alleles are enriched for genes uh, affecting... Uh, keratin, so skin and hair, and it may, you know, that may mean that we've, in Europeans, of a, 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 or out of Africans at least, have acquired some characteristics from Neanderthals that have helped them to adapt to the more temperate and the colder climates um, in that environment. Um, it says also here that genes that are more highly expressed in testes are reduced in Neanderthal ancestry, and similarly, there's a reduction in uh, Neanderthal ancestry on the X chromosome. So it suggests that there was re reduced a Neanderthal ancestry, um, in, in, or decreased fertility in males uh, when they moved into a modern human background. And more recently, there's, uh, people are, have actually been trying to resuscitate from modern human genomes the variant forms in the Neanderthal ancestry. And, and it's kind of weird to think that we probably, if we'd have been sophisticated enough in our analyses. In the 1990s, people said, oh, no, there's no, look in Europe, we find nothing interesting, but that's before we had genomes. But now you can find, uh, in, by looking, as they've done here, they looked at 379 Europeans, 286 East Asian individuals. They recovered over 15 gigabase pairs of introgress sequence that spans 20% of the Neanderthal genome. So just looking at modern humans, you can hoik out 20% of the, so any one of us is carrying only 2.8%, but if you take hundreds of individuals, you can start to pull out uh, a considerable proportion of the Neanderthal genome. Um, and again, the same story coming out, that there are fitness costs to hybridization. So we separated from the Neanderthals for a sufficiently long period of time that when there was admixture, when there was mating between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans, there was a fitness cost. The, the descendants were obviously less fit. Um, and as it says again, source of adaptive rating for skin phenotypes. Um, and it, here it says that the average length of introgressed haplotypes is 57 kilobase uh, pairs. 
Um, and 26% of all protein coding genes, so over a quarter of your genes, if you're European like me, have exons that overlap with a Neanderthal sequence. So, uh, uh, have I surprised any of you? Did you know this before you came in, that, that most of you in this room, probably all of you, actually have got Neanderthal ancestry? Did you know that? You did? Okay. Well, it was a great surprise to the scientific community when that, um, that was published a few years ago, and it really overturned all of our assumptions. But in this field, uh, overturning assumptions seems to be the default. Uh, every year or two, we get something new coming along. And I'm well, perhaps a bit overblown here, quoting Hamlet at this point. But there, um, there are more things out there than we ever imagined. So this is a little bit of finger bone here that came from a cave in Siberia. And I discussed this at one stage with um, Alice Roberts, and she said, oh, it's just a bit of finger bone. I said, well, it may be a finger bone to you, but to me it's a whole uh, genome, um, an archaic human genome and lineage that had never been discovered before. So this, um, again, Svante Pabo at the, at the front, well, at the, at the, as a senior author on this paper, saying that, okay, we've looked at Neanderthals, let's have a look at what other things we've found. And they found this piece of bone, just a little bit of a finger bone, from this cave, from the so-called Denisova Cave, in the Altai Mountains in southern Siberia. Um, and it's just a bit of finger bone, you don't know, there's not enough evidence, there's no skull or anything like that to work out what affiliation it was, what kind of thing it was. Um, but um, they amplified mitochondrial DNA, from well, a complete mitochondrial DNA sequence from this bone, and they showed that it was a completely new, unknown hominin lineage that was as distinct from anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals as they are from each other, more or less. Um, and this was completely unexpected. So what it meant was that Neanderthals, or the ancestor of Neanderthals, walked out of Africa whenever it was, 800,000 years ago, million years ago, uh, but a completely other kind of, of, of archaic human also left Africa and started colonising um, the rest of the world. And interestingly, this cave also showed evidence of Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. Um, so that uh, was kind of intriguing. So this is where the cave is. And this is what happens when you draw the phylogenetic tree. So all of us anatomically modern humans from there, and you can see the same old pattern we've seen many times before, that all the out of Africans are just supposed to be one little part of the tree. Africans all the way out there. But Neanderthals way out here. Now, by this time, we had several Neanderthal sequences. And Denisovans, the Denisova cave, actually an outgroup there. Um, so this was a remarkable finding, um, but they just went on and on. And again, Svante Pabo went in and uh, then sequenced the whole genome, nuclear genome as well as the mitochondrial genome, and showed that it actually, when they looked more carefully, that the branching order was that this group shared a common origin with the Neanderthals before they, uh, so uh, more recently than they shared a common ancestor with anatomically modern humans. And this population wasn't involved in the contribution of gene flow from Neanderthals into Eurasians. But what they did find when they looked at genomes from humans all around the world was that there was a group of humans that had received uh, genes from this particular lineage. So they gave this lineage the name Denisovans at that point, someone in the population, and they said it contributed 4 to 6% of its genetic material to present-day Melanesians, so people from Papua New Guinea and the areas around there. Um, so in addition to the finger bone, they also found a tooth in the same cave that had a mitochondrial genome highly similar to that of the finger bone. And so this kind of tangled web of human ancestry gets even more tangled in that we now have it that we have a branch coming off earlier than the, the branching between Neanderthals and Antonymous. Dennis Ovens coming off here, 
and then just giving ge a genetic contribution to just one of these lineages of anatomically modern humans. And the weird thing is that Siberia is actually a long way from Papua New Guinea, uh, and quite how and when this admixture happened is unclear. Uh, presumably there was a sweep of humans that moved through Asia, and they went all the way to Papua New Guinea, and somewhere along that route they met the Denisovans. Now maybe the Denisovans actually had a much broader uh, range than uh, we might expect from just what we found in Siberia, and we'll say more about that at the very end of the lecture. Um, but it's uh, intriguing. And then um, they just keep, you know, every every year there's a there's, things come into sharper focus. So uh, finally they got to the stage of having a 30-fold high coverage genome of a Denisovan, um, and this allowed them to show that there was um, they they could by looking. If you look at humans, obviously we've got two copies of each chromosome, and you can look to see by looking at how much variation there is between the two chromosomes how inbred an individual is. And so they could get an idea of how much um, genetic diversity was, and they said it was extremely low. Um, and um, they could then get a catalogue by m measuring the, uh, this of what changes um, happened in modern humans as a result of this um, during, during our separation from the, the Denisovan lineage, again, looking at this issue. Um, and again, it starts to get a bit of a, of a list of things. That, do they make much sense? Well, eight genes in the brain and nervous system, uh, kind of interesting, one of which has been, uh, two of which have been implicated in autism. On one of those implicated in autism, this CTN uh, NAP2 gene, is also one of the targets regulated by FOXP2. So it starts to look a little bit like a smoking gun, that maybe that's something to do with the, the changes that made us human. Um, the other issue that they found was that there are some genes that have associations with human uh, diseases that, ca that carry fixed uh, substitutions, changing the uh, amino acids in modern humans compared to Denisovans. Uh, and so you know, it, they're saying various aspects of our physiology may have changed relatively recently in, in modern humans. And the way this is going now is that if you look at, uh, this is a recent review I put in the folder for you, if you think, what, one of the questions is, well, was it, when we see these uh, evidence of ad admixture, there are two potential explanations. One is that there really was a divergence of a lineage that was separate for a long time and then interbreeding put some of that back in or maybe that divergence happened a long time ago so maybe humans and anatomically modern humans and neanderthals were living alongside those lineages living alongside each other a long time before in africa it's just a population structure in africa and what they've been able to show is actually no it really was admixture because when you get a crossing between, say, a Neanderthal mates with a modern human, the, the tracks of Neanderthal DNA that are left in the genome will be actually very, very, you know, initially it will be a single, whole chromosome will be from the Neanderthal. A few more generations, it will be half a chromosome, quarter of a chromosome, and so on. But they will be very, very long tracks suggesting recent ancestry, whereas if it's ancient ancestry, it will all be shredded up and, and, and merged up into short tracks. So by looking at the lengths of those tracks that show particular ancestry, you can make inferences. So people have been looking at this uh, in more detail over the last couple of years, uh, trying to work out which uh, genes have come in to modern humans. And they show that basically some of the HLA loci uh, that we see in modern humans, these alleles, have actually come in from our archaic humans. So this particular HLA-B star 73 that's common in West Asia seems to have come from Denisovans. Um, and also there are other HLA alleles that uh, have appeared in modern Eurasians that have uh, come from these archaic populations. In fact, they're saying now half of the HLA alleles in Eur Eurasians and Europeans and Asians have actually come from these um, and been selected for, presumably, after they've arrived in the human populations, that have come from these archaic lineages. Now we don't have time, ten minutes to go. Um, so, the kind of current picture is that, you know, modern humans 
He walked out of Africa. Some went north and west into Europe. Some went easterly into Asia. The ones that went north met up with the Neanderthals. The ones that went in this easterly direction somewhere met the Denisovans and interbred with them. And what you can do is you can go through chromosome by chromosome and you can look at parts of the chromosome that are heavy in Neanderthal ancestry. So here, if you go through this part of chromosome 9, you can see this blip here where suddenly 60% of the genomes that you're looking at from your population of modern Eurasians have this particular Neanderthal allele. And conversely, there are parts of the genome where you can go through and you can see what you might call a Neanderthal desert, where there are no Neanderthal. You know, the average is about 2-3% of that genome is, is, is Neanderthal, and then you get a region where there's none at all. Um, and so picking all this apart and working out what's actually happened uh, after the uh, interbreeding between anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals is a key research area at the moment. Because <coughs> um, in in, I'm trying to get through this in one hour, I suppose because I've got two hours I didn't have to rush, but there's so much coming out at the moment. I've just thrown three recent studies onto one slide here, but um, this complete, let's say here, complete genome sequence of a Neanderthal from the Altai Mountains, so from the same site as the Denisovans, um, and they, in this paper they looked at the uh, population history of reconstructing from those archaic genomes and from 25 present day humans, um, and they not only suggested that there was gene flow from Neanderthals into anatomically modern humans, and Denisovans into mod and solidly modern humans, but also at least one additional archaic lineage for which we have no fossil record that also may have contributed. One of the most remarkable things is that you can actually go and sequence the, the ancient DNA and reconstruct the methylation patterns. Um, so you can look at epigenetics of Neanderthals and Denisovans um, and start to look at the ways, uh, you know, get a much more detailed view of genome function. Uh, as I say, differentially methylated regions, over 2,000 of them found uh, when you do these comparisons. And they're mu in regions that are much more likely to be associated with diseases. So it's starting to give us a kind of evolutionary medical view, uh, you know, evolutionary medicine of how diseases came to be. And then finally there's this uh, genome sequence of a 45 year old, uh, 45,000 year old not 45, uh, hu modern human from Western Siberia now, you know, we're guesstimating that humans probably left Africa 50,000 uh, years ago, maybe, maybe 60,000. So this is quite a short time after the arrival of anatomically modern humans in this part of the world. And what they found was when they looked at the segments of Neanderthal ancestry in this genome, they were substantially longer than what we see in present day individuals. Um, and, so, and their estimate was that, that the, the gene flow into the ancestors of this individual occurred maybe seven to 13,000 years before he lived. So this was you know, giving you a snapshot of um, Neanderthal, uh, the entry of Neanderthal genes into the modern human lineages. And just when you think, wow, that's amazing, this paper came out, I think it was last year, where they showed that... Um, they found an individual from Romania that was dated to about 37,000 to 42,000 years ago that was massively enriched in certain parts of the genome. These green bits here are Neanderthal uh, sequences within this otherwise anatomically modern human genome. Um, six to nine percent of the genome was Neanderthal. And what they said that meant was that it had a Neanderthal ancestor as recently as four to six generations before. So this is an anatomically modern human whose great-great-grandfather or great-great-grandmother was a Neanderthal, uh, which is, I think, amazing that we can actually see that kind of resolution in these, this material. Nearly getting to an end. One of the most interesting sites uh, in Western Europe uh, for uh, anatomic uh, for, for, um, human ancestry is this site in the Atapuerca Mountains. And on the 1st of March, I'm actually going to this site. I'm very excited about this. And there's this particular cave here, this so-called 
uh, Cima de los Huesos, or um, Pit of Bones, where a large number of um, fragments, over 6,000 fragments of bones were found, <coughs> representing 28 individuals, which date from about 400,000 years ago. And these um, have been assigned to a human um, lineage called Homo heidelbergensis, um, or Homo, he Homo antecessor, that some dis disagreements between which ones belong with which. But um, these were analysed recently, and um, this 400,000-year-old 400, mitochondrial genome was remarkable for two things. First of all, it pushed back the dates that we could actually do ancient DNA analysis well, by almost a factor of 10. So to actually go back that far and get DNA was absolutely astonishing. But the um, interesting thing was that these, these groups were supposed to be kind of on their way to being anatomically modern human with a bit of Neanderthal in them. When the mitochondrial genome was sequenced, this particular individual formed an outgroup with the Denisovans, clustered most closely with the Denisovans, uh, but still fairly distantly from the Denisovans, um, outside the Neanderthals, outside anatomically modern humans. And that, like, what, what the hell's going on here? One minute, we're saying the Denisovans lived in Siberia, and that's where the Central Asia is where they hung out. That's where the Papua New Guinean ancestors met them. Suddenly, they're over here in Spain. Um, and it just shows, really, that the continual set of surprises that, that, that these sequences are generating. And we still haven't quite got a clear idea what this means. Um, and I co we come back next year and we come back the year after and give these lectures. It will be the same again. This will become clearer. Some things will get s solved, but other things will become more murky as time goes on. And this was um, a, a figure... Uh, there's a guy, David Reich, who's been working with Svante Pabo quite extensively, a very bright individual who's been trying to reconstruct all these possible gene flows that have gone on. And this was his idea a couple of years ago uh, when he f that we first got that Neanderthal from the Altai Mountains. He basically is saying that there's some potential unknown hominin lineage which appears to have given some sequences into the Denisovans. Uh, then there is the Neanderthals of Actually, some evidence that Neanderthals have interbred with Denisovans. The Denisovans have interbred with, with humans have uh, gone on to populate Oceania. Um, and then the Neanderthals interbreeding with the ancestor of all non-Africans. Uh, so we're starting to get a very um, kind of murky picture. And the simple story I told you in the last lecture, you know, basically Anatoly modern humans walked out of Africa and colonised the rest of the world, is... is it's still over 95% true, but there's so much uh, uh, devil in the detail here in all these different events going on. And uh, actually, I put in the, in the Dropbox folder, there's a paper that's just come out that, uh, so it's looking at this saying, you know, be sparing the Occam's razor. We assume things will be simple. They don't appear to be that simple at all. There seems to be all sorts of things going on uh, back in the Pleistocene. So, in conclusion, we've now got multiple uh, Neanderthal mitochondrial sequences, and they're all outside the range of uh, modern human variation. And that led us to believe, back in the 1990s, that um, they were separate species, and that was that. We now know from genome sequences that there has been admixture. It's still small scale, it's only a few percent, but nonetheless, it is absolutely clear that it's happened. Um, we've maybe been able to reconstruct some of the phenotypes associated with Neanderthals from their genomes. We've now got this evidence of uh, archaic admixture from other um, uh, uh, archaic groups, particularly the Denisovans, um, and, and another, perhaps a, there's some evidence that there's an African population as well, an uh, archaic population. Um, but the thing is, we're going to get more and more gene and uh, genome sequences promised. And if you remember in the last talk, I pointed out that the earliest, uh, the most divergent human mitochondrial uh, sequence was actually found in an African-American. I think probably went to 23andMe or some similar thing. Um, and that was surprising. That It must have, you know, that, that lineage carried across the Atlantic as part of the slave trade and then ships up in America and, well, it survived. 
And I've had a chat with one of the experts on Neanderthals, and, well, what's the chances that the Neanderthal mitochondrial genome, uh, mitochondrial haplotype survived in modern humans? Well, at the moment, we've only got a few tens of thousands of human genomes, and there are seven billion of, of us on the planet. It'd be interesting when we come back, when we've got millions of human genomes or millions of mitochondrial haplotypes done, well, you know, it, well, it, it's quite possible that, that Neanderthal mitochondrial sequences have survived in modern humans and Denisovans. Uh, we'll have to see. It's all very exciting stuff. Of course, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be surprised when we look at some supposedly anatomically modern humans. There's a local boy, Ozzy Osborne, had his genome sequence a few years ago and they discovered Neanderthal ancestry. And is that surprising? Right, that's me finished. One last thing I'll say. Is there any of you are particularly interested in this and you want something to read uh, in your spare time? This is an excellent book by Svante Pabo, which is a, a kind of memoir of his personal and professional voyage through life. Um, and it, it shows uh, not just the story, the surprises of, of recovering Neanderthal genomes, but also tells you all sorts of politically incorrect things about his own sexuality and how he managed to steal a woman from his one of his colleagues and but he stole her because he was basically bisexual and she looked like a boy and all sorts of things that are a bit weird in there as well so it's definitely worth reading um, if you're interested um, and that's it that's just the images so you've got an hour free now has anyone got any questions or comments no stunned silence if I'd have known I had an extra hour, I could have told you about the peopling of the world and we could have spoken all about the origins of the English and the Maoris and the Jews and stuff. I'll have a lecture on that. But you'll have to find, you can find that lecture on YouTube if you're interested.